Hi folks, Seth Leibson here. Thanks for watching my monologue. In these uncertain times, you may be thinking about personal protection. If you are, I urge you to visit my friends at Guns Etc. They'll help you find the perfect protection for yourself and your family, and they can even teach you how to use it. They've been protecting Arizonans for over 33 years, and they stand for the great principles this country was founded upon. Or you can just click on GunsEtc.com. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriots' YouTube channel. Welcome back and happy December 11th, 2020. Interesting thought came up on the show yesterday. The thread running from the violence of the Black Panther movement from the 1960s and 1970s to the BLM movement this year. It further raised the question, looking at these Marxist movements, as to whether communism was defeated, as we thought, in the early 1990s, or whether, in the end, Whitaker Chambers was right in his worry when he left communism and said, I fear I'm joining the losing side, the lo losing side being anti-communism, freedom. Let us start with the proposition that we did not think fighting communism in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s was a losing battle. We knew it as a long twilight struggle, but we didn't think it vain for two reasons. One, as Chambers also put it, if communism did, did succeed, its triumph would mean slavery to men wherever they fall under its sway and spiritual night to the human mind and soul, his words. Second, we thought we would win. As Ronald Reagan would put it, quote, I believe that communism is another sad, bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages even now are being written. I believe this because the source of our strength in the quest for human freedom is not material, but spiritual. And because it knows no limitation, it must terrify and ultimately triumph over those who would enslave their fellow man. For in the words of Isaiah, he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increased strength. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. Close quote. That was in his Evil Empire speech, 1983. Then, as you know, six years later, we celebrated the walls, not of Jericho, but of Berlin coming down. Even then, however, in 1989, we hesitated. By we, I mean the West. From Ronald Reagan's successor to darn near everyone else. P.G. O'Rourke captured it exactly right. He wrote this in 1989, having just come back from Germany at the time of the Berlin Wall's breach. He was teary-eyed, but knew we in the West didn't quite celebrate it quite rightly. And thus we didn't bury the ideology of the Wall, of Marxism, quite rightly. He wrote, I think there are a lot of people that don't get it. Our own President Bush seems to regard the events in Eastern Europe as some kind of odd dance craze or something. When I got back to the United States, I was looking through the magazines and newspapers, and it seemed that all I saw were editorial writers pulling long faces about whither a united Germany and whence America's adjustment to the new realities in Europe. Is that the kind of noise people were making in Times Square on VE Day? I say shut up, you egghead flapgums. We've got the whole rest of history to sweat the small stuff. And those discredited peace creeps, they can zip their soup coolers too. They think Mikhail Gorbachev is a visionary. Yeah, he's a visionary like Hirohito was after Nagasaki. We won, and let's not let anybody forget it. We the people, the free and equal citizens of democracies, we living exemplars of the rights of man, tore a new you-know-what into international communism. Their wall is breached. Their gut string is busted. The rot of their dead body politic fills the nostrils of the earth with a glorious stink. We cleaned the clock of Marxism. We mopped the floor with them. We ran the reds through the ringer and hung them out to dry. The privileges of liberty and the sanctity of the individual went out and whipped butt. And the best thing about our victory is the way we did it, not just with ICBMs and Green Berets and aid to the Contras. Those things were important. But we also beat them with Levi 501 genes. 72 years of communist indoctrination and propaganda was drowned out by a three-ounce Sony Walkman. A huge totalitarian system with all its tanks and guns, gulag camps, and secret police has been brought to its knees because nobody wants to wear Bulgarian shoes. They may have 
They may have had the soldiers in the warheads and fine-sounding ideology that suckered the college students and nitwit third-worlders, but we had all the fun. Now they're lunch and we're number one on the planet. Made me want to do a little sack dance right there in the Cold War's end zone. We're the best. We're the greatest. The only undefeated socioeconomic system in the league. I wanted to get up on that wall and really rub it in. Taste the ash heap of history, you bullshit nose wipes. It's PJ O'Rourke. But that is not what we did. Instead, we wrung our hands and worried because we were unused to winning and unused to a new ordering of the world along the lines of freedom. We were unused to something other than real politique. Too bad. It was a case of not understanding ideology or philosophy, theirs or ours. To most students of political philosophy, it meant Marxism and its adherents and legatees. To those who left Marxism, they still were worried about political philosophy because they never understood philosophy could be something other than Marxism. They forgot if they ever learned that our Declaration of Independence, speaking to the freedom and inherent rights of man, was perhaps the best political philosophy lesson the world has ever known. But they did not know that, and they worried, wrongly, that the invocation of equality in our Declaration could lead to a state-imposed effort and force and seizure, which is definitively not what our founders intended, taught, or thought. And so we Americans threw up our hands and ignored that while we defeated the Soviets, we didn't defeat the ideology underneath the Soviet Union. We let it take stronger and stronger root in China and decided to make money off of it. We appeased it in Cuba. And through an incredible level of psychological self-doubt and self-questioning, we let it grow in our own academies of higher learning. Yes, there were always Soviet apologists in our universities, but they were soon joined by not just the defense bar of the Soviet Union, but the prosecution bar against the United States. In his book, How Democracies Perish, the French philosopher Jean-Francois Ravel wrote, Clearly a civilization that feels guilty for everything it is and does will lack the energy and conviction to defend itself. The sophisticated thing you see was to hate Reagan, to hate capitalism, to hate American foreign policy because what, jingoistic? Seem not to be on the side of the little guy and the poor? That was always wrong. There was no greater anti-poverty program than anti-communism. There was no greater anti-poverty program than an employment and opportunity society that provided work and income and led to property ownership. Seizing property was what the communists wanted and argued as just. Providing opportunities to own property was what we wanted and argued as just. Abraham Lincoln understood this, while Columbia University did not. Here's how Lincoln put it, quote, The strongest bond of human sympathy outside of the family relation should be one united all working people of all nations and tongues and kindreds. This should not lead to a war upon property or the owners of property. Property is the fruit of labor. Property is desirable. Property is a positive good in the world. That some should be rich shows that others may become rich, and hence is just encouragement to industry and enterprise. Let not him who is houseless pull down the house of another, but let him work diligently and build one for himself, thus by example assuring that his own shall be safe from violence when built. All of this is a long way to get us to what I started with. As the Marxists converted the class struggle into a race struggle, the socialism of Marx to the ethics and theories of national socialism. Harry Jaffa put it this way, both Nazis and Marxist communists take as their foundation a view of history derived from 19th century neo-Darwinian biology. The Nazis saw history as a competition of races with the struggle for power, determining who was the fittest and who deserved to survive, and rule. The master race stood in the same relationship to the inferior races that the human race had stood in relationship to the lower, lower order of animals in the old view of things. Hence these inferior races could logically and consistently be enslaved or exterminated or used for their hides and tallow the same way we use cattle. The Holocaust was no more to them than the shambles of the Kansas City stockyards to us. In the case of the communists, they substitute the words class struggle for the race struggle of the Nazis. But the human consequences are the same. Anything denominated counter-revolutionary 
in a Stalinist regime suffers the same fate as anything called dysgenic or racially harmful in the other. That is why the abandonment of human nature is the abandonment of the ground of all morality. Communism, particularly Marxism as National Socialism, is nothing if not an abandonment of human nature and trying to create a new human, a new creature. Think about what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis race today, mixed in with a still-continuing obsession over class, a la Bernie Sanders and AOC. Think about the 1619 Project in our schools, the whiteness exhibit and learning materials from the Smithsonian, the New York Times Project on whiteness and education, the critical race theory courses in our schools and federal government. Are we on the winning side? If we are not, and if we don't start winning, twilight will be the last thing we see. Stygian darkness will be our future, or as Whitaker Chambers put it, a spiritual night to the human mind and soul. I'm Seth Leibson. We'll be right back. <laughs>